Hello everyone, I am Daniela Camboni and welcome to the great Bitcoin versus gold debate on Stansberry Research featuring Michael Saylor and Frank Joustra. I'm honored to be moderating this historic event. In the Bitcoin corner, we have Michael Saylor. He is the CEO of MicroStrategy and has become the flag bearer for the community after making a bold move and becoming the first CEO of a publicly listed company to convert a part of his company's cash reserves into the cryptocurrency. He has publicly said that his mission with this debate is to convince his opponent, Frank Joustra, to sell his gold and buy Bitcoin. On the gold side, we have Frank Joustra. Early in his career, Frank transformed Yorkton Securities into a global powerhouse of mining finance and was behind the creation of some of the world's leading mining companies. Frank is considered by many to be a modern renaissance man, having founded Lionsgate Entertainment, Modern Farmer, Dominica Fiore, and a long list of other ventures. Today, he dedicates most of his time to his philanthropic work. He most recently launched the Million Gardens movement alongside Kimball Musk. Frank has publicly stated he was coming into this debate with an open mind, but wanted to challenge Michael on statements he has made on gold and Bitcoin. Today, Michael and Frank will be battling it out in perhaps the most important debate ever to be held on this subject of gold versus Bitcoin. Cyber Hornets argue that Bitcoin represents a powerful digital network that will thrive, a quasi-technology stock without profits or CEO, but with near-perfect security and distribution. Gold bugs, on the other hand, say gold is the ultimate and timeless store of value, that it is an asset that the financial system will turn to time and time again whenever there's a storm. But I'll leave it to the debaters to battle this out. I'm going to go over the format and the ground rules now. This debate will cover six topics along with an open and a closing statement from each debater. They will each have five minutes per topic except for the close where they will have six minutes each. Once they have made their points in the five minutes, the other side will have a one minute rebuttal. I will be acting as moderator and hence there will be no follow-up questions from me, but we will be moving on to the next topic. All right, well, welcome. Frank Joustra joins us from Los Angeles and we have Michael Saylor in Miami. Gentlemen, I have eagerly been uh, awaiting this day. Uh, so welcome, welcome, Frank, and welcome, Michael. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Awesome. So as I stated at, in the opening, uh, we're going to start with opening statements. You'll have five minutes each year. We decided ahead of the debate and Michael will kick things off for us. Uh, this will be five minutes of uninterrupted time. Uh, please consider it your blank canvas, in a sense, to set um, the statements you'd like to make during this debate. Michael, please kick things off for us here. Thanks, Daniel. <clears throat> so the debate is uh, Bitcoin versus gold. I think that all gold holders and all Bitcoin holders agree on sound money principles. And the real debate is which is the best monetary system in order to pursue the ideals of sound money. So I think we uh, start with some basic ideas. First of all, human civilization rises through channeling energy. Uh, we invented fire, that's capturing chemical energy. Uh, then we build our cities next to rivers, we're capturing water and we're channeling gravitational energy. The aqueducts were critical to the Roman civilization. Uh, when we compress air in a canister, we're channeling uh, pressure. Uh, electric systems and batteries are channeling energy. Lasers are channeling photons. Uh, if we want to better the human condition, we need to be able to capture, store, and channel that energy. Money is energy. Money is a store of value, and it's also a technology that allows us to trade that energy over time and space. So if we look at the history of money, we've gone from commodity money to coinage of those commodities, to notes represented by that money, to fiat currency, and now we have cryptography as a basis of money. Now, what's the sometimes gold, gold advocates say that gold is the ideal money. Well, really, the ideal money, if, if God came down and God waved his or her hand and created the ideal money, it would be based upon Luca Pacioli's modern accounting principles of double entry accounting, and if you had godlike power and you could implement a double entry ledger like Pacioli introduced in 1494, and you could perhaps you could define 21 million units that are infinitely subdividable, trillions and trillions of times each, you could maintain that in magic space 
and then you could settle everybody's trades instantly everywhere on earth, everywhere in the universe in a fair and equitable fashion, that would be a good money. We could call that God coin. And God coin is like perfect instant transactions, never losing any information. Well, the next best thing that we've invented is, as humans is Bitcoin. So Bitcoin's the most efficient monetary system we've yet to implement successfully. It's 21 quadrillion Satoshis, 350,000 transactions a day. It costs about 10 basis points of the monetary network to clear those transactions and to secure the network. And it stores the value and provides security to everybody on the network effectively for free after those transaction fees. Bitcoin's the most disruptive force in the century. In 12 years, it grew to, 12, to $1 trillion in, in monetary value. That beats Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and the like. That's the market sending us a message. It's the next chapter in the mobile wave. We digitized our photos, we digitized our videos. Now we're going to digitize our money and our currency and assets are gonna to flow to billions of people. Money is collapsing. Uh, we've got a massive inflation problem. We're losing 1% of our value in currencies every single month. Humanity without an effective strong money is like a, a type one diabetic without insulin. You can't store energy, you can't create fat, you're going to starve to death. Without delivering effective money to the human race, uh, everybody's going to either economically freeze or starve to death, violence and misery are going to follow. Gold's not a solution. It's not practical to distribute gold in small quantities to 5 billion people. Bitcoin is a solution. It is spreading at more than 200% a year. Uh, we're adding 3 million users a week. It's accelerating. If I wanted to give knowledge, music, and money to the world, in the 19th century, you did it with books, pianos, and gold. They're now antiques for the elite. In the 21st century, you're going to use the internet platform in Bitcoin, and you're going to provide iBooks and Google and YouTube. You're going to provide Apple Music and Amazon Music and Spotify to everybody. And you're going to provide Bitcoin as an asset for everybody. Uh, gold used to be the best solution. It isn't anymore. The time has come to pass the torch from gold to Bitcoin. Bitcoin's humanity's first effective engineered monetary system. It's as profound as our rail networks, our road networks, our electrical networks, our telephone networks, and the internet. Uh, Bitcoin can and will deliver the virtues of strong money the gold idealists have long hoped for. Michael, thank you for your opening statements. Now we'll go to Frank Justra uh, with your opening remarks, please. Five minutes Thanks, of uninterrupted time. Thank you, thank you. And, and, and Michael, thanks for, for agreeing to this debate. Um, uh, and congratulations on your Bitcoin position. That's, you've done very well. Uh, and I'm looking forward to exploring the facts, okay? So as I've said a number of times recently, um, I don't have a problem with Bitcoin. Um, I think it's here to stay in some form or some value for some purpose. I'm not sure what that purpose is yet. I do have quite a few issues with the way you and others have made certain claims about Bitcoin. Um, and I want to point out the risks that um, exist but are, but are never addressed. And I want to defend some of the um, statements that you've made about gold. Uh, and in doing all that, I'm hoping to draw a distinction between what Bitcoin is, what it isn't, what maybe it aspires to be. Understanding that distinction is uh, very important because uh, you need to assess that distinction to assess its risk profile and therefore where it fits in any given portfolio. Uh, I think our viewers deserve to know that risk uh, and they need to know that how that distinction happens between gold and, 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 and Bitcoin. Um, you know, I don't think Bitcoin is a safe haven asset yet. Um, I don't think, I think there's a very good chance it never will be. I think it may aspire to be, but aspiring to be something doesn't make it so. And, you know, sometimes I dance around the living room in my uh, underwear, but it doesn't make me Madonna. So um, as far as your claims on gold, 
I'm not really sure what you're trying to achieve uh, by disparaging gold. I mean, I do have a theory, and you're welcome to correct me if, uh, if you think I'm wrong, but I think um, you're trying to create a narrative for a higher price for Bitcoin. And in order to do that, you need to convince everyone out there that gold is worthless, and all of that value that currently, currently resides in gold will be all transferred, all $12 trillion of it will be transferred to Bitcoin. Um, and that, in that way, you can justify a $500,000 Bitcoin price or a million dollar Bitcoin price. Um, otherwise, why would anybody pay $60,000 today uh, without that target in mind? I can't see any other way where you can make the kind of claims that you're making about where the price where Bitcoin is going. And I think it's a really clever approach, and I take my hat off to you. You've been very effective. Uh, and, and, and in many ways, I think it's sad because I think Bitcoin believers and gold believers agree on 90% of everything. And we fall apart on this 10 last 10% of which one is better. And I think it's all part and parcel of this binary attitude that exists in you know the discourse in America in America today, you know you're either on one side or the other. And there's no middle ground. Um, but I see it as a strategy of um, your strategy, where the stakes are kind of do or die, um, it's sort of a Game of Thrones per se. But the truth is, we're only in the first season, and there are a lot of risks that lie ahead of us. And the question you have to ask is, will you still be alive in season eight? And uh, I just don't think you are presenting the risks that face Bitcoin in order to get there and, and survive. Um, you, you like to pretend those risks don't exist and you gloss over them because uh, I think you're in a race to win. And, um, and I think that's kind of sad. But pretending that, that Bitcoin is a risk-free asset uh, is just, I think, naive. Um, because if you fail to subsume the entire value of gold, what are you left with? You're left with hoping that a greater fool is going to come in and pay a higher price. I think the threats are real, and I think the biggest threats are going to come from government and central banks. Um, history has shown that governments go to extreme lengths to protect their monopoly on currency, and they will not to tolerate a global decentralized currency. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and especially if we have, say, a dollar crisis, which I think we can all assume is coming somewhere down the road. Uh, and your claims that Bitcoin is untouchable, unstoppable, are simply not true. Uh, and by the way, you don't have to kill Bitcoin with a death blow. You can severely damage or kill it with multiple cuts. So you've been very effective at pretending that there aren't risks, and I think I'm going to spend the rest, most of this conversation, just pointing out where the risk is, where the risks exist, and I just think telling your viewers that Bitcoin is going to double every six months is, I, I find I get I, I have a lot of trouble with that. So whatever the outcome is on this, this is on you. But perhaps you'll change my mind, and so let's get on to it. All you right, know, let's get on with it. Fantastic opening remarks uh, from you both. Thank you for that. Now let's get into the meat of it. We're going to start with our first topic. It is asset comparisons. Um, Michael, uh, I'll begin with you. We'll kick things off here. It's been said that in a, an ideal store of value will have these eight attributes. It's durable, portable, fungible, verifiable, divisible, scarce. It has an established history and it's censorship resistant. So my question to you is, when you're doing an asset comparison of Bitcoin versus gold, how do you make the case for Bitcoin as the better asset? You'll have five minutes of uninterrupted time and Frank will have a one minute rebuttal. Okay. If we think about the elements that drive uh, humanity forward, if we think of it from an engineer's point of view, you've got stone, you've got iron, you've got concrete, you've got steel, you've got aluminum, you've got silicon. You can't build a computer without silicon. You can't build a skyscraper without steel. Uh, you're not going to survive if you don't pick the right element. Crypto is the steel of the 21st century financial economy. An engineer would say, you have to choose wisely. There's a right answer. There's a wrong answer. 
So gold is element 79. It's an ideal ornamental metal. It's indestructible, malleable. It's attractive. We love these things. It makes great jewelry. It makes a great ornament. It's just not a perfect monetary asset because you can inflate gold. You can confiscate gold. It's immobile. It's not easily divisible. And you can counterfeit it. Uh, it shows up in, uh, in the economy in a heterogeneous fashion. Lots of different types of gold coins, lots of different types of gold bars, lots of different types of gold jewelry. And the paper gold itself is, is sometimes trading a, a hundred to one versus the underlying physical gold. And there's no trusted protocol to guarantee the integrity or the synchronicity between paper gold and actual gold. If we compare that to Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin is not just an asset, it's a network and it's protocol. People would say it's the world's first global self-settled real-time clearing bearer instrument. It is all those things you mentioned. It's decentralized, permissionless, global, immutable, scarce, auditable, instantly transferable, not seizable, highly divisible, mostly everything that gold can't do. Um, the asset itself, secure, easily divisible, it's deflationary. People might lose some Bitcoin. They're never going to add more than 21 million. You can transfer it around the planet. It's transparent to everybody running a node. You can authenticate it instantly from a $100 smartphone. Um, that that's, uh, makes it the perfected monetary asset of the human race. We've never actually had an asset that clean. It's synthetic gold without the defects of monetary gold. Now, the network itself, it's global, it's open. Anybody can run a security node or a validating node on the network. It's empowering to billions and billions of people. It's, it's vital because it's being continuously upgraded in the software layer and the hardware layer. And it's viral. It's spreading at a rapid rate. Companies, countries, individuals are adopting this. And that makes it, as Nicholas Love would say, anti-fragile. Uh, it just keeps getting better. Um, the protocol is the third element of the asset which makes Bitcoin superior. And what's special about that is it's a protocol for synchronizing financial applications with integrity to the underlying Bitcoin asset. It's been adopted by, built into Square. It was built into PayPal. Uh, and uh, and why, what does that mean? Well, that means that Bitcoin applications, Bitcoin is harder it's smarter, it's faster, and it's stronger than the gold that came before it. Harder meaning gold has a half-life of 30 years. You make 2% more every year. Bitcoin has a half-life of forever. It's, it's effectively immortal, and it's organically evolving. It's only going to be better in 100 years than it is now. It's smarter because the applications running on Bitcoin are driven by modern software and modern, modern CPUs and modern servers they keep getting smarter and faster with Moore's law. You can make a, a hundred million calculations a second around the world across hundreds of thousands of different servers on Bitcoin applications. You can't do that with gold. It's faster. You can do billions of transactions at the speed of light on these applications. You can run them 24 seven, 365. It's stronger. You can channel high frequency energy I could flash 10,000 loans for three days each across 100 jurisdictions between 10,000 different companies and fetch them back with laser-like precision. So in short, Bitcoin, it's more than just a monetary network. It's a trust network allowing millions of applications to serve billions of people. And it's going to accelerate global commerce in the 21st century and it's critical for allowing for safe and efficient operations in cyberspace. That's why the asset is superior to gold. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Frank, you'll now have a one minute rebuttal to that. Your yeah, time begins listen, now. yeah, thank you. Michael, you know, it is a great technology and, and I'll give you that. Uh, and, and I'm not gonna argue the technology and how innovative it is and, and all the things that you say that it does. Um, but so far, it's completely unproven that this is going to be effective as a, uh, a payment method. It's far too slow, it's too volatile, and it has no history. So I don't think that, uh, I don't see a way where it's going to be a method of payment. So the ability to 
transfer Bitcoin around the world at the speed of light, as, as you like to talk about, is, you know, what's the point if, it's, if the only thing you have to hang your head on is store of value? Um, what you say about gold, uh, paper gold and physical gold is, is true. Um, I prefer physical gold. I, I stay away from the gold ETFs for many, many reasons. Uh, I like my gold to have no counterparty risks, much like Bitcoin doesn't. Um, so um, as far as it's you claiming that it's secure, I, I, mean, I will debate you on that. I don't think it's as secure as you like to make it believe, especially if it becomes a threat. Thank you, Frank. Um, I will toss the question now to you, Frank. Same topic, asset comparison. When you're doing the asset comparisons of gold versus Bitcoin, make the case of why you think gold wins here and under which conditions it performs better than Bitcoin. Okay, so listen, uh, I'll give the you know, one minute commercial here that everybody's heard before. Gold is, is eternal and it's almost indestructible. The gold that you may be wearing in your jewelry today might have been a piece of jewelry 2,000 years ago. It, it has been deeply woven into the uh, cultural fa fabric around the world and into the global monetary system. Um, <clears throat> and if you believe you're about to dislodge gold in places like India and China, which are the world's largest buyers of gold, and where it's deeply ingrained in the culture, um, I think you don't know a lot about India and China. <laughs> um, so in terms of its status as money, um, listen, I'm sure if the US could roll back the clock, um, they, they would probably do away with gold because the US relies on its uh, status as a um, having the premier reserve currency in, and it abuses that status to achieve its goals by, you know, again, printing lots and lots of money. Uh, I can't see how Bitcoin is going to be recognized by as money in every country in the world in the way that gold is. Its stability as a store of value is vital to managing the central bank um, uh, reserve currencies, and it's viewed as protection against other fiat currencies. Um, central banks own 33,000 tons of gold which is 20% of all the gold ever mined. And they're furiously buying it year after year after year. Uh, and there's a reason for it. And I, and I can't say the same for Bitcoin. Uh, it's not owned by any of the central banks. It's extremely unlikely it ever will be. Um, and I think Bitcoin makes a much easier target than gold if it becomes a threat. Um, and the central banks are never going to destroy gold. It'd be akin to shooting themselves in the foot. Bitcoin, they have no allegiance to, so they can go after that <coughs> in spades. Um, and gold, you know, one of the other misconceptions, and I think where people get mixed up with the Bitcoin uh, comparison, <coughs> is that gold is not designed to moonshot through the roof like some tech darling. Uh, it's designed as a store of value against inflation, the devaluation of currencies, and sharp equity downturns. Um, it's been tested time and time again throughout history. Bitcoin has never been tested, especially in a financial crisis, because Bitcoin was introduced after the 2008 crisis. In the meantime, gold has doubled since then. Gold benefits in times of crisis and in certain times of economic expansion because of its dual purpose of use in jewelry and industry. Uh, if God forbid there were ever a war, I would prefer to have my money stored in gold, which is going to be safe from cyber attacks on both the internet and the power grids. Um, now, to be fair, and, and I think also that any time that there's a currency crisis, and this is what I'm afraid of, people will always flee to gold. It happens every every time. So, but to be fair, I think it's it's good to point out that central banks do try and manipulate. In my opinion, they try and manipulate and manage the gold price, because the gold price is, in a sense, the canary in the coal mine as to a nation's fiscal health. Um, so any spike in the gold price, yeah, the central banks will try and manage that. But they're never going to try and kill its value, because, again, they'd be shooting themselves in the foot. They don't, it, it's a necessary evil. Um, the U.S. alone, 77% of its reserves Foreign reserves are in gold. That's 4% of all the gold in the world. Um, and China is only declared 3%, but again, they're the largest producers of gold in the world and the largest importers of gold in the world. And they're accumulating at a very rapid rate, and no one really believes that what they've declared is truly what they own. They come out every couple of years, 
and surprise the market with increased reserves in gold. But it, here's the thing, it's, and it's respect with the US dollar that I have a real problem with Michael's approach to promoting Bitcoin, because he tries to have it both ways. On the one hand, he is panicking people into buy, buying Bitcoin, Bitcoin as a protection against this incredible M2 money growth, which he calculates at 20% a year, and going forever at 20% a year. Um, if he's right, and I, I don't disagree that that's the direction the dollar is going in, in terms of money growth, that would have in, create severe problems for the US dollar. It, it would obviously devalue the dollar over time because you would bring in a lot of inflation. And so, on the other hand, he claims that Bitcoin is not a threat to the US dollar, and I think <clears throat> in that sense, he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. And I can only assume that his, the reason is he doesn't want to draw the ire or the attention of the US government um, because uh, it's easier to go after gold. The authorities are never going to come to gold's defense. And actually, in, in a way, he may be doing them a favor by disparaging gold. But again, he can't have it both ways. You can't make that claim that Bitcoin is going to go to the moon and subsume all the value of every asset class and not be a threat to the US dollar. And I think he's probably a bit late because now it's squarely on the radar of a lot of the policymakers, a lot of the pundits, and they're talking about the threat to the US dollar by Bitcoin. Um, and it's going to be monitored very closely uh, as the asset value goes, goes up in price. Um, you know, Bitcoin, just some advocates wrapping comments, Frank. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so listen, there, there's a lot to be said about the way that Bitcoin is being um, pitched as a de decentralized currency, um, but it, it, it's idealistic to think that we're, that the government's going to allow that kind of anarchy. You know, I'm a lover of history and and and, and politics. I'm actually very deeply immersed in geopolitics. And I come from the Machiavellian school of thought when it comes to politics and power. And <clears throat> I'm a realist, and, and, and you may want things to be a certain way, but you have to see the ways things truly are. And anarchism has never worked throughout history. Thank you, And you Frank. just have to look, okay. I, I've got so much more to say about <laughs> this, well, I'll, You'll get, you'll get into the, it. But I gotta, give, I gotta give Michael, because you said a lot of big statements there, and I have to give Michael um, uh, his one minute rebuttal. So Michael, please. Well, Frank says um, Bitcoin's not an effective payment network uh, but method, but the point really is PayPal and Square and Venmo are providing billion transaction instant speed of light throughput on top of Bitcoin's network. And so the payments are going to come from the application layer, the layer two or the lightning network. Uh, Frank says it's not as secure as I think. Well, I think crypto keys or holding the keys to, uh, to a cryptocurrency is the highest property right that the human race has ever invented to date. We can't have stronger property rights than holding $100 million with password keys in your head or multi-signature keys. Uh, everything else is a weaker property right. Um, I, I, I think that the way the world's going to end up, everybody's going to have a uh, a selection of currencies in their mobile wallet and assets in their mobile wallet. And they're going to be the top 10 currencies. The dollar will be the king currency, and they're going to use it as a medium of exchange and instant payment on the network. And then there'll be strong assets. The strongest will be Bitcoin. People will have other assets. And Bitcoin doesn't have to be a currency to be successful. The world, and, and as long as there are successful countries, they will maintain their currency. I think the losers will be the weak assets and the weak currencies. And this is not a currency war with Bitcoin. Uh, this is an asset war. And that's why considering whether I want to put my money in gold or Bitcoin is appropriate. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we're going to move on to the second topic now, which is risk factors. Frank, I'll begin with you. In December, JP Morgan published a report pointing to the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which saw inflows of almost $2 billion compared with outflows of $7 billion for ETFs backed by gold. This was for the period of October uh, to December of 2020. JP Morgan predicts the trend will continue with gold suffering at the hands of Bitcoin. My question to you is this. 
If JP Morgan's calculations are correct, it suggests that Bitcoin only accounts for 0.18% of family office assets compared with 3.8% for gold ETFs. So tilting the needle from gold to Bitcoin would involve the transfer of billions of dollars. Um, how do you make a case against this risk? Well, okay, that's easy. And you have First five minutes. Okay. First of all, I, 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 and I'm going to have to talk fast here, but um, I, I think I've, I don't ever listen to what Wall Street, anybody on Wall Street uh, has to say about things that are more often wrong than they are right. But assuming the Bitcoin is going to continue to be accumulated at the rate that it was and measuring that over a period of a few months, you might as well be throwing darts. That's just not, uh, that's just, that, making that kind of assumption doesn't make any sense. But uh, I think assessing and quantifying risk is the biggest issue facing Bitcoin. I've said that earlier, and it's one thing that Michael likes to sidestep or, or, or gloss over. He doesn't feel it's necessary to worry about those risks, brushing them off as black swan events that will never happen. But these risks are real and they're predictable. They're not unpredictable. And it should be taken into account um, before buying Bitcoin. And again, I don't think that it should prevent people from buying Bitcoin, but they need to give some weight into that risk. And as I said, the biggest risk is going to come from central bank and governments. When and if Bitcoin becomes large or popular enough to be perceived as a threat to currency, and, um, and especially the US dollar, and they will go work very hard, and this has been proven throughout history, to try and squash that opportunity or severely damage it. Um, governments need to control their currency. Uh, they need to have that monopoly. and. Uh, I, I just don't see, because they need to manage both their fiscal and monetary policy, and in order to do that, they have to control their currency. So uh, for whether you like it or not, that's the way it is. And um, uh, I think that they also need to control taxation, and that's both taxation that's direct and indirect. And taxation by inflation, which is their, is their current preferred method, means that they can monetize all this tremendous amount of debt that they're producing, um, and you, the consumer, are paying the tax through inflation. Does he actually believe, does Michael, and here's the question, does he actually believe that the government is going to stand by and allow Bitcoin to subsume all the value of gold, and maybe, the, and he's also suggested the entire value of the bond market, and just don't know in what universe he thinks that governments will allow that to happen. Uh, I think it's sheer insanity. You, just have to, you have to ask yourself this every time you look at you know, th this sort of a movement is, what happens when the interests of the powerful with the law on their side are pitted against anarchists? And in this case, the anarchists are, are the Bitcoin. I just don't see how they're gonna let that happen. And again, they don't need to deal Bitcoin a death blow. They can do it with multiple cuts. And what that might not take Bitcoin out, but it will sure change its investment proposition and therefore its performance. And the attacks can come in any form, okay? And I think the easiest is legislation. Um, and simply banning uh, Bitcoin, making it contraband, or making it illegal for uh, ex uh, Bitcoin exchanges to accept fiat for Bitcoin would wipe out all the institutional buying, most sophisticated investors, and drive Bitcoin underground. Um, and it would certainly take a lot of the air out of the Bitcoin price. Uh, the FB, if, the F, if it were banned and the FBI requested records from the exchanges, they would give them up. All exchanges are tied, to all points of connections and exchanges are tied to the US dollar system. So it's very difficult to escape tracing or, or, or monitoring. And, and who's gonna take the risk if there's prison time uh, is the penalty to leave a trace on their computer. I just don't see why anybody would take that risk. So there's, that's one approach. The other one is more direct. You know, they can hack. Uh, and I know that they can certainly do sustained hacking on the on and off ramps into, in, into Bitcoin trading. Uh, and if, if you think about it, if, if the U.S. defense network can be hacked with backdoor, secret backdoors built into the hardware, who's to say it can't happen with, with, with Bitcoin. And I think, again, you have to take those risks into consideration uh, that they're real and they exist. Now, I've heard the argument, and this is how the argument comes back from all the Bitcoin people, is that, oh yeah, there's a handful of senators that are Bitcoin friendly and are going to provide 
cover for the Bitcoin investors. And you know, that's going to matter just as much as those handful of politicians that are pushing, proposing legislation to make gold and silver money in order to avoid tax. That's never going to happen either. So I, I just, I, I just don't, I don't get it how they're going to let this, let, let this happen. And they will always use the excuse, the government that is, that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So I don't think that you're going to get the kind of protection that, that, that you're hoping for. Thank and governments, governments will use any excuse knowing that the real reason is going to be to man, protect their monopoly on currency and keep their ability to execute monetary and fiscal policy, but they'll use other excuses if they want to go after Bitcoin. Crime, consumer protection, the environment, you know, they can say, you know, Bitcoin produces more CO2 emissions than, you know, a billion cars. Um, uh, money laundering, and the catch-all phrase, national security. And if they can use national security to renegotiate bilateral trade ideals, don't think, don't think that they can't use it if Bitcoin becomes a threat to the currency. Central banks, again, I go by the golden rule. They own the gold, they make the rule. They have seven trillion dollars worth of gold. They're not about to allow some other asset class to, to be a store of value to, subs, to subsume that, that, that value. It's just not going to happen. Um, Thank you, Frank. Wrapping comments, please. Okay, well, I just think that um, I have other points with respect to countries, central banks creating their own digital currencies. They're all, everybody's looking into China as the most advanced, and they're not going to want the competition. And if Bitcoin gets big enough, they will go after it and eliminate it. And that's just the way the world works. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Michael, you will now have a one minute rebuttal to that. The central banks don't own any Bitcoin. As soon as one country starts to buy Bitcoin for their central bank, the price is gonna rip, first point. Second, uh, US dollar is gonna be the big winner from the spread of Bitcoin. Five billion people are gonna have a mobile wallet on their phone, they're gonna have a currency layer running on lightning rails or running on a compliant payment rate will have the US dollar, might have the Euro. The big losers are gonna be the bottom 50 countries. They're gonna lose their currency privileges. All the collapsing economies in Africa, South America and Asia, they won't keep their currencies. People will, uh, will switch over to the dollar. Uh, Bitcoin is critical to US technology supremacy and the US dollar supremacy. And one day, 5 billion people will use the US dollar as a currency. I don't think the government's going to fight it. I think the government's going to embrace it. And uh, will the government stand by and let Bitcoin grab gold's uh, capital share and part of the bond market? Well, they allowed the, the growth of the Vanguard 500 and the S&P 500 and ETFs and bond mutual funds and gold ETFs. I think that as long as the assets sit in regulated banks and custodians, they won't have a problem with insurance companies and investors investing in Bitcoin rather than an S&P 500 index fund. Finally, uh, will, will there be a political pushback? Well, there's two to three million people a week that are buying into Bitcoin around the world. Coinbase added a million a week in the first quarter just on their platform. Bitcoin's the most popular investment asset in the history of the world. It's the most popular asset in the world. It's spreading like wildfire. By the end of this year, more than half of the U.S. voters are going to own it. Thank I think you, it'll Michael. be politically popular. Thank you, Michael. And you'll get a chance to speak uh, more about this because uh, I'm sticking to this topic here under uh, risks um, in your question. PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel has said, uh, that Bitcoin could be used as a financial weapon against the U.S. and that it threatens, uh, you know, fiat money, but it especially threatens the U.S. dollar. So, you know, if it is a real threat, why isn't it conceivable? Why couldn't we see the Fed and other central banks stop Bitcoin? You have five minutes to continue uh, your point. I, th here. I think Peel, uh, Thiel's comments were misinterpreted. What he was saying is it's going to be the base layer for the 21st century fintech economy. The lieutenant governor of the China Central Bank just embraced it as an asset, not as a currency, and said, and uh, under proper regulatory regimes, it would be appropriate for an investor to own Bitcoin. So I think the sentiment is evolving amongst uh, leading politicians. Risk factors. Here's my thought about risk factors. Gold invites violence. 
Alexander, you know, gallivanted around the world to seize gold. Livy tells the story of 1,000 Roman sieges in order to steal the gold. Caesar sacked Gaul to take their gold. Kublai Khan seized the gold. Pizarro seized gold from the Incas. Cortes seized gold from the Aztecs. Charles I seized the gold from all the British nobles. The Prussians seized gold from the French in 1871. In World War I, everybody seized the gold. Lenin seized gold from the church in 1922. Roosevelt seized everybody's gold in 1933. Stalin seized the gold of the Spaniards in 36. Churchill took everybody's gold in 1940 at the onset of the war. At Bretton Woods, the United States seized the world's gold and then you know, took it hostage. And then Nixon killed all the hostages in 1971. Gold's always getting ceased. The problem is you can't secure gold. The cost to secure it goes up with the number of nodes or caches of gold, the value of the gold in the cache. It's regulated. You have to secure it with guns, people, steel, concrete, carbon. It doesn't scale. If you want to stress test it, you ask yourself the question, when I give this thing to 5 billion people, how much is it going to cost me? So gold transportation costs don't scale because the more transactions, the more the value of the transactions, the more jurisdictions, you know, brings more cost and more regulation. And you need guns, people, vehicles, and carbon is too expensive for most transactions. Gold audit won't scale because the more nodes, the more transactions, the more value, the more cost, and the regulators get involved. It's very people intensive. It's infrequent, slow. It's unreliable. It's a risk factor. Gold security transport and audit are regulated by every nodal jurisdiction. They're corruptible, they're uncompetitive, they're antiquated, they're elitist, they're ineffective, and they're out of reach for 99.9% .9 of the population. The gold applications, what we call paper gold, they don't, have, they don't have any technical protocol with integrity, so they're all corrupted by hypothecation, regulation, and inflation. Bitcoin security transport and audit are pretty effectively free. They're effective, they're unregulated, they're egalitarian. Everybody has the same rights. A, a person with $100 of Bitcoin has the same security as someone with a billion dollars of Bitcoin. There's competition to continually improve the services. They're decentralized. The security nodes are decentralized and they're protecting the interest of the holders from local violence, local regulation and local corruption. Is the Bitcoin miner in Iceland or the North Pole or Siberia or China protecting the interests of somebody in Manhattan or Ontario? And it's a beautiful thing. Gold's physicality and indestructible nature, they invite malefactors to kill you and take your property. Bitcoin safely stores your property in cyberspace where it can't be seized by force. And that encourages peaceful negotiations rather than coercion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Frank, you'll now have a one minute rebuttal for that. Yeah, you're right. You know, there, there have been a lot of wars, a lot of blood and treasury spent on protecting gold over the century. And that's why, you know, it's, it, uh, you're making my case that gold has real value. Uh, people have fought very hard for it and they're not about to give it up easily. And so I, I'm not sure that that, that makes sense. Um, and again, I prefer physical gold. You keep coming back to the paper gold. I agree in some ways about paper gold. So, I, but I don't think those issues apply to physical gold. Um, the cost to secure it. But listen, again, you, you're you're not accepting the fact that as Bitcoin, if it achieves the value of gold as you're suggesting, it's a sitting duck. It's sitting out in the open and can be easily attacked. I would r rather have my money in a safety, uh, my gold in a safety deposit box, than out in the open where once it's a threat to the currency, and you can't deny that. It's not going to be a threat when you, you, you know, you, you said the U.S. dollar is going to benefit from this. I don't know how you can possibly say that when you're talking about 20% money growth every year now and forever. It, that's how you destroy a currency. The U.S. dollar is not going to benefit from this. And Bitcoin is not, if Bitcoin pretends that it's going to provide the solution, they will kill it. It's that simple. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for your rebuttal. We will move on to our next topic now, which is historical performance. Michael, uh, I'll begin with you. Bitcoin is appreciating at 200% a year 
and you have said we cannot expect it to expand any faster. So one of Bitcoin's uh, biggest strengths is clearly its price performance, but could it also not present its biggest risk? The higher Bitcoin gets, the more fear of missing out trade catches fire. If this risk-taking behavior continues, isn't it causing a risk in and of itself since the price may be based purely on speculation? You have five minutes on this topic. Well, I think Bitcoin's uh, getting much less risky. And I'm going to start with an, a review of the history here. In the last one year, Bitcoin's up 693% versus 4.66% for gold. Its sharp ratio is 4.7 versus 0.43% for, for gold. Uh, over five years, a dollar invested in gold would yield $1.33. A dollar invested in Bitcoin gives you $132 for Bitcoin. If you actually chose gold instead of Bitcoin, you lost 99% of your wealth. It's devastating. Over a decade, Bitcoin's running about 190% on average every year versus 1.65% for gold. And again, the sharp ratio is 4x as much. Let's take a century. Well, people know that uh, gold was $20 a ounce and now it's $1,700 an ounce. And so you could say, well, it's like up almost like factor of 80 or 90. But when you actually risk adjust it, you realize there's nobody that actually got that return over the course of the century. 95% of the gold was confiscated in the last hundred years. So maybe theoretically the United States government might have got that gain but everybody in Russia, China, every country in Europe, everybody in South America and Asia, they all lost their gold. So if you do a risk adjusted calculation, you find that you invest a dollar, it should be worth a hundred dollars, but you lost it, not all of it, 95% of the time, you got five bucks. And so the real risk adjusted return over a century is 1.5% per year. It's not any better than the last decade is devastating. Over a millennium, Gold, you know, 2,000 years ago, gold was like 80% of money. Gold was money. And then it slid from 80% to 40%, you know, in the, in the Middle Ages. By the time we got 1940, it's 40, and then 30, and then 20. And today, the, the monetary value of gold is maybe 5 trillion, half of the gold supply. And, and the total store of value in the economy is 250 trillion. So you divide 5 trillion and 250 trillion, and gold is 2% of all money. Over that time period, you know, it came with thousands, if not millions of massacres and seizures. People talk about Bitcoin being volatile, but in the year where Bitcoin went up 693% in 12 months, here are the maximum drawdowns if you look at the, at the end of day closing price on Binance. 13%, 10%. 14%, 11%, 25%, 11%, that was the worst on two, uh, two, 126, 21%, 16%, and 12%. So in fact, in order to get a max drawdown of 25% to get a 693% advance is pretty historic performance. Bitcoin liquidity is increased by a factor of three, uh, well, by a factor of 10 versus normal days over the past six months. You know, we had 6.9 billion trade on Binance two days ago or a day ago. So you're talking about $10 billion a day in the spot market. Gold peaked August 10th, around the time that MicroStrategy announced that we bought 250 million worth of Bitcoin. And I came to this with a completely objective clean slate. I said, I got to buy gold or I got to buy Bitcoin. But my, my, my conclusion was, if Bitcoin works, gold probably won't. And if gold works, Bitcoin won't. So what's the difference? Well, if I chosen gold, I would be minus $4 billion today over eight months versus Bitcoin. It's a $4 billion choice. One is right, one is wrong. As, as everybody says, gold has a long history of manipulation by governments, banks, and miners. Jim Rickards, the new case of gold, he says the paper market could easily be 100 times the size of the physical market. Quote, there's no doubt we're seeing price suppression through the paper market. Rigging futures is child's play. I respect his comment. Bitcoin's first decade was marked by legendary volatility. There's no doubt. But the assets matured. The network has spread. It's entering its second decade. It's like LeBron James at age 19. 
the best player is always the most volatile player. If you look forward, what you see is an extraordinary asset on an extraordinary network that solves the problem better than gold can solve the problem. That's why I think it's the right choice and there's consequence to making the wrong one. Michael, uh, thank you for that. Some incredible statements being made here. Uh, Frank, you'll have a one minute rebuttal now. All right, well, I, I have real trouble with the way you calculate um, what is happening at any given time between Bitcoin and gold. And I've heard you say this before, you know, last year, uh, gold showed that it didn't perform uh, versus Bitcoin. Listen, if I chose one year periods in Bitcoin over the last four years, it would look a lot worse. So you cannot define what the value of gold is based on six months or a year of trading. You have to look at a, over a much longer time period. That's number one. Number two, I have real trouble with how you calculate your 190% compounded annual growth on, on Bitcoin. I'll get into that later. But the, again, I, I think it's, a, it's a, always a function of garbage in and garbage out and how you calculate your returns. Um, Maybe gold isn't used as money today, but it certainly uses a, a store of value, and it's never failed on that. And again, I will get into that in a moment. Um, in, in, in your claim that, listen, you made all these billions on, on, on Bitcoin versus gold over a one-year period, you have to understand that, that the, what dynamics drove the Bitcoin price up and why gold did not go up. And I think that that's, again, I will get into that in a moment, but uh, that in itself does not tell you or demonstrate that Bitcoin is a store of value. Thank you, Frank. And you will have time to expand here uh, because it's your turn now uh, for your question. In August of 2020, we've said it, gold made new highs of $2,075 per ounce. Gold was up 36% for the year. The M2 money supply continued its unstoppable write up and the dollar kept falling. With the stimulus measures, the trillions dollars of debt and the Fed doing more easing Gold didn't continue on the path of higher highs. Instead, here we are and having corrected circa 12% year to date. So the most common reason I hear is that Bitcoin has now replaced it as the asset of choice. Economists have even said that gold without Bitcoin, without competition from Bitcoin, pardon, would increase in value by 13% each year for the next decade. So the question is this, did gold's 3000 year reign as the ultimate currency officially end in August of 2020, Frank? Well, the short answer is no, absolutely not. Um, and listen, you have to understand what gold is. And this is, and again, there are a lot of misconceptions about what the utility of gold is for investors. And first, we need to clarify one big misconception. It's not the gold price that you need to be looking at. You need to be looking at how it's measured against certain currencies at certain points in history. And, and let me give you an, an example, because it makes a huge difference in into the reason why you need to own gold. Um, so let's take the Argentine peso, which Michael loves to use as a means of demonstrating which, what, what happens to currencies when they get into trouble, when they're mismanaged, much like what the US dollar is experiencing today. The Argentine peso, gold in Ar Argentine peso terms has gone up 28 fold in the last 10 years. Take a more recent example, the Turkish Lira, which is experiencing its own currency crisis at the moment. It's gone up fourfold in the period, gold in, measured in Lira terms, has gone up fourfold in a period of four years. That's how you measure the true value of gold. Also, you need to understand what happens during periods of high inflation. That's when gold performs really well. The last time we experienced that here in North America was in the 1970s. And when gold went from $35 to 850, that's 25 fold because we had high inflation. Uh, now we haven't seen in this current cycle high CPI inflation yet. All of the inflation has gone into assets and that's why we have all of these asset bubbles happening, which one could claim Bitcoin as an asset bubble. Um, and, uh, and so you really have to understand that part of it because it, that's when it's gonna become evident. Uh, now, just a little fun fact, traditionally, and when we talk about what happened with gold last year, when gold has a big down dip, central banks and jewelers come in and, 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 and buy on the down dip, and they buy big. And we saw this recently, 
uh, with both the jewelry buyers out of India buying record amounts this last month and with the central banks declaring that on the down dip they continue to buy at a furious pace. Now contrast that with Bitcoin and so when you talk about performance in, with respect to Bitcoin it's not an appropriate term. Bitcoin has not been around long enough to, to be able to determine its utility as a store of value. And I don't buy the argument that a, mean, a mere 10 years of history is going to be enough to indicate what the future performance is going to be. It's just silly. It's never been properly tested. Um, so is Bitcoin impacting the price of gold? I think partially yes. I think, and I think, I have a good friend of mine who's an economist who recently did a regression analysis on attributing what factors affected gold and why gold turned down. It was about 40% was attributed to higher bond yields. 36% uh, was uh, to a higher US dollar, which was temporary. And 24% was uh, attributed to Bitcoin. So it, Bitcoin is having an impact, and I, and, I, and I can't deny it, but I actually think this is more of a North American perspective than it is a global perspective in ter terms of this rush into Bitcoin. Um, it's worth noting that the US dollar is still benefiting from its reserve, premier reserve currency status. Um, but as the world starts to fragment, the, glo the global monetary system starts to fra fragment, and you have countries like China, Russia, and Iran all looking to decouple from the US dollar for a whole number of reasons. Um, as that fragmentation takes place and less, and less trading is done with US dollars, the dollar will come under pressure, it will, and especially with this money growth that we're talking about. Now, most Americans will only know, see that when it happens to the US dollar. They will only see the value of gold when it's measured against US dollars. Americans have a very funny way of seeing everything in US dollar terms. Um, on the volatility side, I mean, you know, people have very short memories. Sure, Bitcoin's done very well the last couple of years, but if you take points throughout the last 10 years, it's had stomach-churning roller coaster ride, and that's, and there's no reason why that won't continue, and so I can't see why anybody would invest in Bitcoin if the objective was to preserve value. Now, on a personal note, Michael, I think you're fighting the wrong fight. Gold is the least of your worries. You need to keep your eye on central banks and governments because they're going to be the ones that you need to look out for. And um, I know that Jerome Powell has been dismissing Bitcoin as he dismisses gold as both speculation vehicles. And he's doing the same thing that every other one of his predecessors did, disparages gold, now it's Bitcoin, um, while they're in office. You know, Alan Greenspan was a gold bug before, then a gold bug after, but during his time as chairman of the Fed, he was disparaging gold. And they do that because it is a threat, and especially if it becomes too popular. Um, so I think investors re really need to ask themselves, if they're looking to store value, which one's better, gold or Bitcoin? Thank you, now, I'm Frank. choosing gold unless you have some way to change my mind. I still choose gold. Thank you, Frank, for that. Michael, a uh, one-minute response, please. You know, you can't achieve the gold performance as an individual due to the seizure risk. Uh, gold bugs uh, for a decade have been uh, viewing CPI and waiting for CPI inflation, and they haven't gotten it. The inflation came over the last 10 years, and it came to the assets, not to the consumer goods because of technology and other dynamics. Um, all the money's flowing into stocks, bonds, and other assets. It's not flowing into gold. So gold doesn't turn out to be a monetary inflation hedge. Uh, gold is better in a collapsing currency, but locals can't easily get it, and they can't easily use it like Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the egalitarian solution with more utility. You can put it on a $50 Android phone, and you can buy it with plus or minus 1% markup. Finally, among central bankers, there's a growing consensus that Bitcoin's a digital asset, not a digital currency. That's been articulated by the Chinese Central Bank, by the U.S., by Jerome Powell at the Federal Reserve, by Christina Lagarde at the EU Central Bank. And it's, it has the merit of being true. It is a digital asset. You don't buy it to use it as a medium of exchange. You buy it to hold for long periods of time.
Thank you, Michael. We're going to move on to our next topic now, which is supply dynamics. Frank, Michael has said that as the price of gold goes higher, so does the incentive to mine and prospect it, which leads to increased supply. He has also said, quote, ultimately, you have to find something which you can't print more of that doesn't have its fundamental underpinnings tied to a fiat currency. And the only thing I can find right now is Bitcoin. So while gold can be labeled scarce, how do you defend the fact that in theory it does not have a ceiling to supply? You have five minutes, Frank. All right. Well, um, from listening to Michael in the past, uh, when he talks about gold supply, it's, 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 it's clear to me that he doesn't have a, a real understanding of the gold mining industry. Um, just before I talk about supply, let me just clarify on demand. So about 50% of gold demand comes from um, jewelry, mostly from India, where it has deep cultural ties. About 20-25% comes from central banks and they've been buying furiously over the last 10 years, and the other 20-25% comes from, um, from investment. These numbers fluctuate a bit, but they've been pretty steady over the years. So that's the demand side. On the supply side, I think Michael has made some very erroneous assumptions about gold and gold production. I've spent my entire adult life financing gold uh, development and exploration around the world. And I can tell you, even when you find it, it's not easy to mine. The average period between discovery and production is 10 to 20 years and sometimes longer. And the grades are getting lower and lower and it's becoming very expensive and, and time consuming to find, find these deposits. No world class discovery has been made in the last 30 years. All the gold discovered in the last 10 years is less than half of the amount of gold that was discovered in just one year in 1990 when gold was under $400 an ounce. The gold mining industry is facing an existential crisis when it comes to its reserves. They're depleting and they can't replace them. Over the last eight years, the reserves held by major mining companies have dropped 40% over the last eight years. And uh, the, as I said, the grades are getting lower, which means you have to move a lot more debt, which raises the cost exponentially. So uh, there is one big problem. And the truth about mine supply that's going to really help Michael here, because I, 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 I don't think he really understands how price does and doesn't affect gold. Um, in 1971, when gold was $35 an ounce, the, the global production of gold by mining companies was 1,500 tons. Scroll forward 50 years, gold's gone up 50-fold, 6,000%. That number has only doubled to 3,000 tons a year, which averages out to 1.5% uh, growth per year, which is about the, the same you see in terms of population growth. Now, comparing it to Bitcoin, yes, Bit Michael's right, Bitcoin's supply is capped, but there's still a supply of 3 to 4% inflation a year, which is obviously declining uh, over a period of time. But I see a lot of risks in Bitcoin before you reach that zero inflation rate. So I see both gold and Bitcoin have inflation rates and supply, and you can argue that both supplies are declining. So I asked Michael, uh, as the gold price continues to go up, where is all this extra gold going to come from? And I've heard you talk about asteroids, I've heard you talk about some new alchemy process, and uh, if you seriously believe that, bring it on, but I suggest you don't go there because I, I just don't, that, that just doesn't make any sense. The fact of the matter is that for both Bitcoin and gold, it's not the newly mined supply that you need to be concerned with. It's the existing stock. And the question you need to ask is whether it sticks as the price goes up. And I've got a lot to say about that. Um, so you've got to stop saying that there's an infinite supply of gold if the gold price goes up. It's just simply not true. Frank Joostra, thank you for that. Uh, Michael? Uh, you'll have one minute to uh, rebuttal that. I would say that this conflict of interest between people that make their living in the gold mining business versus people that make their make their living or, or pin their hopes on gold holding, they're they're actually naturally enemies. And so Frank's uh, life as a gold miner, I think, co colors his view of gold. Um, Newmont Mining and Barrick Gold are the two largest gold miners in the world I could find. I read both their annual reports to get ready for this. 
Newmont mined or, or sold 5.8 million ounces last year, and they reported 94.2 million ounces in reserves, almost you know 18 to one, 18 years worth of reserves. And Barrick mined 4.76 million ounces and reported 68 million ounces in reserves. You know, they found 10, 15, 20 years worth of reserves. They don't have an, an interest in reporting more, but they don't seem like they're anywhere close to running out. Thank you, Michael. And now we'll go to your supply question. With a total limit of 21 million issuable coins, the rate of increase in available Bitcoins is not keeping pace with the number of people keen to buy them. So the price of a Bitcoin keeps increasing. Because its price increases, people feel reluctant to use them as currency by spending them. So with Bitcoin supply constrained and falling short of the demand, do the supply side dynamics prevent Bitcoin from functioning as a currency? Yeah, so my view here is, is Bitcoin's the ideal architecture to be a currency and gold isn't. Uh, I started my career modeling commodities and the history of commodities is as the price goes up, the demand decreases, the supply increases. Gold is a commodity. Bitcoin is a scarcity. As the price goes up, the supply is constant. <clears throat> Historically, all commodity businesses, they need a cartel to be stable. John D. Rockefeller formed a cartel. OPEC is cartel. The De Beer uh, Diamonds cartel is the same. If you look at uh, you know, just about everything in the world, uh, you have to have some kind of restraint of trade. If you can't get it uh, legally through patents, or technically through some special sauce, then you have to get it another way to make the price go up. Otherwise, the price doesn't go up. Um, if we build a dynamic model of gold, it works like this. The price goes up, the miners increase output, jewelry demand decreases, scrap and jewelry get recycled at increased rates. Bankers and financiers sell more gold derivatives short and they're more aggressive about it. Investors fund more mining development and mining expansion. Uh, miners come online, capacity comes online, miners sell more gold. Eventually the price goes high enough, the government stops buying gold, they start selling gold or they short the gold, the price comes down. That's the problem with having 90 kilotons worth of gold as jewelry and, and so many tons of gold sitting in central banks. It's a damping feature. When the price goes up by a factor of 20, everybody on earth is trying to make the price come down and they have a lot of tools to do it, uh, especially because there's no quick link or tight link between paper gold and physical gold. If you look at a dynamic model of Bitcoin, uh, the demand goes up, the price goes up, mining stocks go up, miners stop selling Bitcoin, miners start buying Bitcoin with equity and debt, which keeps going up. Investors buy Bitcoin, companies buy Bitcoin with equity and debt, like my company, which borrowed $1.7 billion at nearly zero interest to buy Bitcoin. Banks can't short the Bitcoin. Governments don't have the reserves to sell to short the Bitcoin. The government has less motive and less capability to manipulate the price down because they don't have it. They can't sell it short. The banks, the mutual funds, the insurance companies integrate and they market the Bitcoin. Big tech. Eventually, Apple, Google, and Facebook integrate and they market the Bitcoin. And investors buy the Bitcoin. Then they get more investors to buy the Bitcoin. The Bitcoin price goes up. The investors, the companies, and the countries buy the Bitcoin. <laughs> Gold mining requires $100 billion a year in fossil fuels, labor, chemicals, and environmental damage and the never-ending struggle to inflate the gold supply and undermine the price. It's providing zero security transport or audit service, and that would cost tens of billions more. I've watched a hundred interviews by David Lynn, and I feel bad for him. He keeps waiting for gold price to go up. And he says on 315 of this year, he says, uh, in a rhetorical question, musing, what if miners stopped mining gold? And he knows the answer, which is if the miners stop mining gold, gold would be a good investment. And every gold investor knows this. Bitcoin mining requires two billion a year in electricity, two billion a year in hardware to provide full security transport and audit service for the entire network worldwide. 
It scales to hundreds of trillions of dollars of assets and annual transfers. It'll support billions of users, billions of nodes, 100 million transactions a year. And it provides the base layer for tens of billions of instant transactions per day on the application layer, i.e. Bitcoin mining is a good use of energy. Gold mining is a destructive use of energy if you're a gold holder versus a Bitcoin holder. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Frank, you'll have uh, one minute. Okay, so again, Michael, you're ignoring what I just told you in my last segment, that the fact is that history has shown that even when the gold price goes up 50-fold, over 50 years, we've only seen a double in the amount of gold mines. So you keep ignoring that, but that's just a fact. Certainly there are, uh, you, as with any commodity, including Bitcoin, there's always going to be supply when the price moves up. And you, you know this concept that a higher price just drives in more buying works to a point. It sounds to me more like a bubble environment than what it be uh, suggested it should be as a store of value. So I just, I'm, I'm still not buying that. Um, you're going to have obviously jewelry scrap sold into rising prices. But the, as I said earlier, the jewelry, the jewelry demand has been steady year after year after year. It represents 50% of the demand for, 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 for gold. Um, and now, listen, you can't, you know, if you're going to tack gold on environment and energy, I mean, you can't even go there. I mean, the amount of energy consumption that Bitcoin uses today is the entire population of Nigeria, 90 million people. It's estimated soon it's going to be the entire energy consumption of Japan. And as far as the environment, I mean, most of that hash rate's coming out of China, where there's a lot of coal, including, it's got hydro, but a lot of coal. And, and there are CO2 emissions that are getting dangerously high and are going to be looked at by the environmentalists. So I, you know, I, I don't think you want to go compare environmental damage between gold and Bitcoin, because I think you're going to lose that battle. Thank you, Frank. Uh, we are going to move on to our next topic of discussion, which is ownership structure. Michael, there is a common perception that when it comes uh, to Bitcoin ownership, there are some primary risks. Uh, you've already uh, you, we've already brought up some before, but someone could get access to your private key and take your Bitcoins. You could lose your private key, um, you know, and that basically cryptocurrency is a technology based, which leaves this investment open to cyber attacks. So if you are speaking to your friend, your best friend, how would you present the risks of Bitcoin ownership? Yeah, I, I think when we look at the ownership structure, Bitcoin versus gold, what you have is a dichotomy. Uh, gold owners tend to be a bit cynical, more conventional, less technical, more traditional. They rely upon metrics like CPI and conventional sovereign interest rates. They tend to be diversified. They're traders. Sometimes they're speculators. Bitcoin holders generally are maximalist and they're, and they're believers in the technology as a force of progress to elevate the entire civilization. And it's not a speculation, it's not a trade, they're not hedging. Um, I'm gonna give some quotes. Jim Rickards in the new case of gold, quote, gold's an attractive part of portfolio, still it's always prudent to, to diversify. I've consistently recommended a modest allocation, 10% of your investable assets. My advice to investors is simply to get gold, but not too much. Uh, Frank, you said, what I do best is create and build mining companies. 10% of your portfolio should be in gold. Gold won't keep going up forever and rotate out of gold following the panic buy. He said that on Stansbury, December 2020. And then the famous Peter Schiff said, quote, I don't own much gold. I own more gold stocks at Salt Vegas 2019. And a lot of gold companies don't even have gold. They're exploration companies trying to find it. They're speculations. Newmont Mining, $11 billion in revenue, has $5.5 billion in cash, EBITDA of $5.7 billion last year, paid a massive dividend, $1.45. They actually mine gold at $750 to $1,000 an ounce. They've returned $2.7 billion to their shareholders. They paid $7 and $4 million in taxes. They're dividing it out 40 to 60% of the free cash flow above $1,200 an ounce. 
they have effectively zero net debt, and yet they borrowed a billion, nine hundred eighty-five million dollars at two hundred and twenty-five basis points last year. They could borrow five to ten billion more. What does this mean? It means they're mining gold as fast as they can so that they can buy cash. They don't even think it's worth. They they could buy ten billion dollars of gold for two and a half percent interest. They don't think the gold is going up. They think the gold is going back to twelve hundred. Barrick Gold, the same story. They paid uh, one point three billion dollars in tax last year at a twenty seven percent rate. They're overmining the gold. They're returning capital to their shoulders as fast as possible. 750 million this year, massive dividends. These gold miners don't believe in gold. They don't have any gold on their balance sheet. They could borrow $20 billion at 3% interest and buy gold if they believed in it. They don't believe in it. They, by the way, talk about hating gold. They could actually cut their sales of gold back and eliminate all their taxes. That's $2 billion in tax those two companies paid. They could take it to zero. Not only did they overmine the gold, sell the gold, drive the price of the gold down. They also paid off, in one case, $12 billion of debt, Barrick did over the past 10 years. They won't borrow money, and they're actually double taxing the gold by paying the dividend. They first pay the income tax rate, and then they force their shareholders to take the dividend rate. And the message is, we don't actually believe gold is money. <laughs> We don't know what is money. We'll let our shareholders figure it out after we basically drive the price of gold down and pay 50, 60% tax the dividend, the money back. It makes no sense. Gold miners are maximizing the gold supply to the detriment of everybody in the gold industry. On the other hand, I ran some polls. 75% of Bitcoiners intend to recruit three more people to Bitcoin's cause this year. 43% are going to recruit 11 or more. 84% would rather mortgage their home to buy Bitcoin, right? Not the gold miners, but the Bitcoiners do. 51% of Bitcoiners believe that have more than 51% of their allocation to Bitcoin. And uh, the equivalent is 84% of people that answer my gold poll have 10% or less in gold, and they only half of them answered. So the, when you look at ownership structure, you have Bitcoin maximalists that view Bitcoin as money. They're optimistic, they're all in, they think the number's going up, they think freedom is going up, they believe in the Bitcoin standard, it's viral, they have laser eyes, it's technology, there's a master plan, make the world a better place through technology. They're more passionate than any of the gold bugs, any other investor group I've ever seen. Gold holders on the other side of the equation, uh, they're a bit skeptical, they've been burned, they're a bit cynical, and even the advocates aren't really willing to commit more than 10% of their portfolio. And it leaves you with the last question, which is, if you're only going to invest 10% of your portfolio in gold, what are you going to invest the other 90% in? Michael Saylor, thank you for that. And uh, unfortunately, Mark Bristow is not here because I would have loved to hear his, his rebuttal. But Frank, you'll, you'll have a minute here. Okay, well, first of all, uh, in terms of the portfolio allocation, and again, this is where Michael is confusing what a store of value, safe haven asset, what its purpose is. And this is how we're going to differentiate between what gold is and what Bitcoin is. And he's made a very strong case for, for why I think you should own gold. Yes, only own 10 to 20% of your portfolio in gold. It's your hedge. It's your insurance. It has the inverse correlation with other asset classes, and it's how you store your wealth. What Michael is describing is a speculation. You know, the buyers coming in just simply because the price is going up. Okay, and the idea that you would put all of your money into Bitcoin because there are no other proper asset classes to invest in is simply ludicrous. That's asking for trouble. That's, you know, that's how people get wiped out. Um, as far as gold mining companies, yes, they're, in, they're not in the business of owning gold. And uh, several companies did try it in the past. Shareholders, because it's a public company, want to see earnings. And then it's up to the shareholder to take his profit from the mining companies or his dividends and invest it in gold if they so choose. That's an individual decision. Um, the way you just described how Bitcoiners are recruiting new recruits. 
three per, I can't remember what you said, three per year, three per month. This sounds to me like a pyramid scheme. It, it's just, it, 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 it gives me all the reasons why I don't want to own Bitcoin. Okay. And as far as freedom is concerned and that their freedom is going up, this is just fantasy. It's, it's, it, you, we don't live in a world where anarchy will be allowed. And so they can have all these idealistic ambitions. It's just not going to work in the real world. Thank you, Frank. You'll have more time to elaborate on this because I am asking you the question now. You've already alluded to some of it. But what is it truly about the ownership sh structure of Bitcoin uh, that makes it hard for you to accept compared to gold? Five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's hard for me to determine whether the Bitcoin market is a real market or not, um, it's, or whether it's truly representative of a real market. And, and you know, we have these so-called whales, and their level of ownership, I think, is a big factor in the price trajectory of Bitcoin. Um, last I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, these numbers might have changed a bit, but the last I heard, 2% of owners own 95% of all the value of Bitcoin. 1,000 individuals control 40% of the market. Let me repeat that. 2% of the Bitcoin owners own 94% of the value. That to me is reminiscent of a penny stock promotion where you have a group of people coming in early, buying large, large positions in a tightly held deal, and then getting out there and promoting the daylights out of it with wild claims about what it can do, and about creating riches. And I just think that that is a very, very dangerous thing. Um, tightly held deals are easy to manipulate. <laughs> That's just a fact. Are we to believe that Bitcoin is the only asset class that is not manipulated? Every other asset class is, and that's why we have regulators. Bitcoin doesn't have regulators. That's why it's potentially very attractive to manipulators. And there are many ways to manipulate a tightly held D. Painting the tape and upticking are common methods, but we'll never know. And it should be a concern to us that the price of Bitcoin has been manipulated. That's number one, okay? Um, as far as the recent buyers, I think it's important to take a closer look. We need to differentiate between Wall Street, hedge funds, and the traditional longer term institutional buyers, okay? And let me start with Wall Street, which Bitcoin folks are touting as an important step in the validation of Bitcoin. I don't take much com comfort that Wall Street jumps into anything. They will jump on anything that is going to make them money. And whatever the flavor of the month is, whether it's mortgage-backed securities, tech stocks, SPACs, emerging markets. And when things blow up, as they sometimes do, they just move on to the next thing. Uh, if you look at uh, Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan, he hates Bitcoin, can't stand it, but he certainly allows his firm to find business angles to make money out of it because business is business. Hedge funds, and this is where people get really confused. <laughs> and I hear names like Gunlatch, Druckenmiller, Paul Tudor Jones as all being Bitcoin buyers and therefore lending credibility to Bitcoin. Um, you have to understand what a hedge fund is designed to do, which is very different than traditional institutions. They're designed to look for momentum and higher and take higher risks for higher returns. If the price starts to underperform, they move on to other things. Right now, Bitcoin is giving them momentum in spades, so they're all over it. But if it were to start underperforming, they're, they're in the business of moving out of that and finding something else. And they're certainly not buying into Michael's buy and hold forever. That's just not the way they operate. As far as the institutions, um, and I think you know, another good example of that is that you know, it's very similar to how, say, Warren Buffett, who was a gold hater for a long, long time, bought a large position in Barrick Gold, and all the gold guys got all excited about it here, and he's a believer, he's a believer. Sure, they bought it, and then he turned around and sold it when he had made a profit. And I, I see Bitcoin, with respect to hedge funds, as being the exact same scenario. Traditional institutions, my good friend Larry Fink just came out with, and he manages BlackRock, the largest money manager in the world, $9 trillion under management, came out with, last week and said he doesn't see any real institutional buying in Bitcoin yet. What worries me are the millions of Robin Hub, 
Robinhood type buyers that are investing and looking to get rich quick. Because when they pile into Bitcoin, and if something were to go wrong, they're the ones that usually are left holding the bag um, because they're not sophisticated. They don't know how to assess risk. So I just think that you really have to understand who the buyers are to determine what validation is being assigned to Bitcoin. Thank you, Frank. Uh, one minute for you, Michael. Um, you know, people think Bitcoin's a speculation if they don't understand how the technology works. But once you understand a technology is superior, it's not a speculation. As for a pyramid scheme, you know, like objecting to something because everybody else thinks it's a good idea doesn't seem, you know, appropriate. Technology spreads virally because it is a better idea. Uber, WhatsApp, iPhone, YouTube, Netflix, they all spread virally. People tell their friends because it's a good idea. Uh, as for the 2% of the owners of 9% of the value, I don't even think that's true. That's probably based upon looking at wallets on the blockchain. Most of the accounts are concentrated in custodial wallets controlled by the exchanges. So for example, Binance has 56 million accounts. It's probably got just a handful of wallets that are reflecting those 56 million accounts. So no, I don't think there's, there's any truth to the idea that uh, the value is concentrated with 2% of the owners. I think that's just uh, a misconception. Um, worrying about the millions of people that are buying Bitcoin uh, I think it ignores the observation that everything else they could buy is riskier. And so if you dissuade them from buying Bitcoin, you're encouraging them to do something which is riskier. There's no zero, you know, there's no simple answer here. It's a zero sum game. You either buy the thing that's less risky or buy the thing that's more risky. They got to do something. Thank you, Michael. We're going to move on to our final topic before our closing statements. Now it is market forces. Frank, Michael said that if God Design gold with no imperfections, he would have designed Bitcoin, that it is thermodynamically perfectly sound money. He even said in an interview with me, quote, there will be a lot of pushback and it will be natural, but it's not going to change the inevitable. The world needs a digital monetary network. It's a two, three, four trillion dollar problem and you're not going to be able to stop it. So how do you respond to this market force, Frank, that seems inevitable? Mm. Well, I think you might be right that they had God designed it, um, it, it might have been Bitcoin, but I, I think, you know, it, had, it doesn't look like he did. Uh, much like God did not design a world of eternal peace, no competition between nation states, uh, no lust for power, no greed, and we're all sitting around the campfire holding hands singing Kumbaya. That's not the world we live in. We live in a very real world of competition, and this, I think this is where gold plays a very important role. Um, in balancing, you know, balancing that competition. Uh, I think, again, in assessing the market forces, there are two areas that Michael <clears throat> continues to use to make his case. First is how he calculates his compounded annual growth rates. Uh, and the second is what I think is his lack of understanding of correlations between asset classes and how that reflects upon Bitcoin as a store of value, okay? Uh, first, let's, let's deal with the compounded annual growth. What I've heard from him over and over again is, in all the interviews, he, he claims that Bitcoin has 196% annual compounded growth, and then he frames it that that is going to be achievable each and every year going forward uh, until Bitcoin reaches a million, or I've even heard five million from him, um, using statements like it's going to double every six months. That's a gross oversimplification um, and dangerous if you rely on it to make your investment decisions. Calculating compounded annual growth is very sensitive to your entry, starting points, and ending points in the period that you're measuring. It's garbage in, garbage out. And to arrive at his 196% number, he starts at a dollar per Bitcoin, a dollar, in 2011, takes it all the way to $60,000, um, and which includes the fact that most of that return was front end loaded into, that, uh, into the early years from a dollar and up. And I have several problems with that approach. When Bitcoin was a dollar, it was not a real investment. It was a novelty, it was a liquid, it was tightly held. 
I don't, I'm not sure where you would start the measurement, but it's certainly not a dollar. I think it's in the several thousands of dollars. Maybe you can look at when Bitcoin crashed in 2017, settled around $7,000. Um, and that's when the real market started. And certainly I think the real investors have only come in in the last couple of years. Um, but I, I think that uh, if you really, uh, allow me to just give you a couple of examples, uh, because what he does, again, is, and I've seen it a lot when I'm being pitched by wealth managers. If I were trying to pitch you on buying gold, I would say to you, well, listen, if you bought gold in 1971 at $35 an ounce and you held it 50 years, it would have gone up 50-fold, that's 6,000%, which is, works out to about 8% a year of compounded annual growth, which is slightly better than the S&P in that same period. It's pretty good, right? If I wanted to underscore the extreme, I would say to you, hey, listen, if you bought gold in 1971 and you held it for nine years, which is roughly the amount of time we're measuring in Bitcoin, you would have had a 42% compounded annual growth. Um, and I think that that's where, you know, you have to always be aware, garbage in, garbage out. Now, again, as I said earlier, he keeps pointing to last year, gold didn't perform, and that's a certainty that it's not, you know, it's not going to su survive as a store of value. But, and like I said, you can pick any one of the last number of years for Bitcoin, and I can paint you a much worse picture. Um, so, so that's the one part of it. The other part of it is how he characterizes store of value or safe haven asset with respect to what it correlates with, Bitcoin that is and what it doesn't correlate with. And I think that it's really important to understand that to know, again, where Bitcoin fits in a portfolio. Gold has had a pretty consistent negative correlation with equities and the US dollar. That's a given, and that's what's given its, its, its safe haven value. Um, and it's an important portfolio diversifier in the event of sharp equity downturns. By way of example, and this is where I will uh, demonstrate how the correlation works. In March of 2020, when the markets crashed, COVID hit, markets crashed, uh, gold went down 8% initially in that month and then recovered to break even. It did much, much better in emerging markets because there was a flight to liquidity, which usually has a temporary lifting of, of, of the US dollar. If I look at Bitcoin in that same month, it went down 40% peak to trough, ending the month down 25%. Um, Bitcoin only really took off in October of 2020 when it looked like the economy was about to recover. So it was risk on. Gold, on the other hand, did really well in the spring and summer of 2020 when the markets had crashed, QE had begun, and it was risk off. And that's, I think, is the very big difference that you have to pay attention to. Um, if you, like myself, believe that equities are in a bubble, then I think there's a lot of built-in downside with Bitcoin at the moment, because it, it really does behave like a growth stock. Um, I think we have to wait and see if there's a major market correction. And when gold establishes its inverse correlation with Bitcoin, that, to me, will be the evidence uh, that it is a store of value. And we have never seen Bitcoin tested in a financial crisis. So that, again, US dollar crisis, financial crisis, any crisis, that's where you'll see the true test to Bitcoin as a store of value. The real, the other test is inflation. Gold performs really well in periods of high inflation. And I know Michael is suggesting that we're not gonna see high inflation uh, in the CPI. And I think he is dead wrong. You only have to watch the commodity prices going up in price, food prices going up in price. Inflation will hit the CPI. There's no doubt about that. Um, but if you look at the 1970s, for instance, which is the last time we experienced high inflation, gold went up 25-fold over a period of nine years. Thank you, Frank. I'm going to have to give Michael his one-minute rebuttal here. Um, yeah. 
Frank says, I, I'm claiming that Bitcoin will go up 195% a year. That's not true. I've never given any precise estimates for future growth rates. I don't know. I have no crystal ball. I just think it will perform better than the alternatives based upon the laws of physics and the technology dynamics. With regard to time frames, you don't need the 10 year time frame. I think the one and five year time frame analysis for Bitcoin are also definitive. And um, is Bitcoin a store of value? Well, I mean, it's people keep saying it isn't. It seems pretty obvious that something that keeps going up in price and up in value is a better store of value than something which is stably not going up. Thank you, Michael. Um, I will get to your, your comments now in regards uh, to market forces. Uh, my question for you is this, the macroeconomic setup for hard currency is setting up to be excellent. We have abandoned almost any monetary or financial rectitude and the Fed has ruled in favor of inflation and hitting the print button on the money machine. So the question is this, with the easy money policy, make the case of why you'd rather be in Bitcoin than gold. Yeah, I look at the market forces and as I look forward, Bitcoin's creating a global markets in energy in money and in finance that operate across all borders and jurisdictions 24 seven, 365, and they're open to everyone to participate. And we look at the global energy market. If you take the latest generation of S19 grade Bitcoin miners, you can generate one exahash with 30 megawatts of power. At the current prices, that means that energy is, is worth 45 to 50 cents a kilowatt hour sold to the Bitcoin energy grid. That compares to 13 cents a kilowatt hour for typical residential use or 11 cents a kilowatt hour for uh, typical commercial use. You can use that to drive down the cost of electricity everywhere on earth you can rescue stranded energy everywhere on earth. You can commercialize renewable energy anywhere on earth. And you can actually create safe, clean income in the developing world, wherever you find an energy source, selling the energy at 45 cents an hour, kilowatt hour, which is more than you would get in Manhattan. It's a pretty extraordinary thing. It's never happened before in history. Um, Billions are flowing into this mining sector, and I think that uh, the billions that are flowing in the sector are going to create uh, an incredible global renaissance and disruption in the energy business to the good of the world. Um, the global money market. Uh, Bitcoin's creating a global money market. Uh, you can actually trade on exchanges in Singapore or Hong Kong, and for a while the contango gets to 40%. That means 40% is the risk-free overnight rate on Bitcoin money compared to a risk-free overnight rate of like 20 basis points in more regulated markets. The derivatives market, the yield curve development, they're all going to explode on the open exchanges from you know the, the innovators at FTX and Binance and, and every other exchange on the world. They can all plug into the open Bitcoin network. There are rules, but there are no rulers. Um, even though you might not be able to capture this 40% contango in Alabama as a hodler, you could just buy the Bitcoin and wait, and then hundreds of billions of dollars of capital will find an exchange run by an appropriate entrepreneur offering the right sort of derivatives in order to build out that yield curve and drive asset appreciation. That's a benefit to everybody on the network. You know, if you own a billion dollars worth of real estate in California, nothing that happens in Singapore is going to cause your asset to appreciate. And if you own assets that are highly regulated on certain stock exchanges in certain countries, then no innovation in other countries is going to drive up the value of your asset. Uh, this uh, global money market's uh, exploding. Spot liquidity has gone from a billion a day to 10 billion a day. Over the course of the last six months, the future for open interest is exploding and uh, it's truly disruptive. The third major market is global finance market, and this is Bitcoin backed payments, credit, insurance and, and funds. Big tech is entering this space, PayPal, Venmo, Square, Robinhood. Uh, finance companies, Fidelity, Morgan Stanley, all the major banks. The ones that were skeptical a year or two years ago aren't so skeptical anymore. 
the significance is any finance, insurance, or mutual fund company can 10x the value of their traditional offering by injecting Bitcoin into it. And then any big tech company can become a bank. Um, how explosive is this? Well, I think we'll see 150 new holders this year. I think you'll see $500 billion of assets flow onto the network this year. PayPal, Square, and Coinbase alone have a $500 billion market cap. And if you look at their market cap over the last 12 months, they're all exploding. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Citigroup, Fidelity, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. These are major drivers. Contrast that to the gold market forces. The gold industry continues to market the myth of gold as money while engaging in activities to elevate the US dollar as money. And they're mining in an expensive, dirty, dangerous fashion. They're using 20 times as much energy as the Bitcoin mar uh, mining network. And manufacturing, marketing, and selling yellow, me yellow metal is expensive. The next trillion dollars that's spent on gold mining is going to make gold less valuable. Whereas in the year 2035, 99% of the Bitcoin is done. Bitcoin mining is over. Uh, the miners are effectively going to be buying Bitcoin. The stock to flow goes to infinity. The stock to flow goes negative. And all of the money spent on Bitcoin mining is to secure the network, provide billions of people with a better store of value to improve energy efficiency, to make the world a cleaner, better, more efficient place. So the market force, I think, clearly favors Bitcoin. Michael Saylor, thank you for the comments. Frank, one minute rebuttal, please. Yeah, first of all, I have real trouble with you denying uh, your ongoing uh, uh, claims that, uh, that Bitcoin has performed, uh, has an annual compounded growth rate of 196%, and you use that to extrapolate its future performs. You have said it time and time again. I will actually tweet your words right back at you after this is done because that is absolutely not true. Um, I think your idealistic view of the world is really just so off the mark. We live in a very, we live in a world which where the world order is fragmented and it's getting worse and worse. You're not going to get this global cooperation to get behind Bitcoin and with all of the energy assumptions that you're making, it's just not going to happen. That's not the real world we're living in. Um, and, and again, I will go back. If you look at how the governments and central banks will perceive a high Bitcoin price, it's going to be a threat. They will see it as a flight of capital, and they will deal with it the same way that you've seen uh, current capital controls in countries like pre-war Germany, pre-Thatcher Britain, where you could only export 2,500 pounds a year, Greece in two, uh, 2015, South Africa in 2003. Um, when governments see a threat to uh, their currency because there's a flight to something to get out of that currency, they will go after it. And I think you continue to ignore that risk. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. We're going to get to our closing remarks now. There will be no rebuttals. Again, this is a blank canvas to drive your points home. Here we have six minutes each. Michael, bring it home. Gold investors share the same macroeconomic view as Bitcoin investors, but I think they tend to lack one key insight. Money is technology and Bitcoin's superior monetary technology with powerful network effect. I've watched hundreds of interviews of gold advocates and they almost never address the technology issue. I found a reference by Mike Maloney 10 years ago, but for the most part, they're, they're not thinking about technology. Diversification makes no sense when there's a correct answer to an engineering problem. You would never diversify the metal in an aircraft wing or the answer to a math problem or the shape of a ship's hull or the oxygen content in a scuba tank. When the cabin depressurizes, you don't place an oxygen mask on 10% of your family. Um, money is a winner take all competition. There is an answer. Choosing the wrong answer has dire consequences. If we contrast the golden knight with the Bitcoin dragon, the golden knight's got a 30 year life. It's plodding, stupid, heavy, predictable, and stagnant. 
up against the Bitcoin dragon. The dragon is immortal, teleporting, dematerializing, hyper intelligent, rapidly evolving, moves at the speed of light. Which one of these two is going to win the fight? Gold bugs say put 10% of phys uh, into physical gold to protect against the bank crash. What about the other 90%? They're not really providing a solution. They're suggesting a hedge. Bitcoin is a solution. Um, Mike Maloney, he says, quote, the greatest wealth transfer in history is therefore the greatest opportunity in the history of mankind. Well, yeah, if you actually pick the winner, in the wealth transfer. If you pick the loser, then you miss out. It would be a shame to actually know this is coming and then miss out. The gold standard fails because gold doesn't provide, it doesn't sufficiently empower people to control their own property. Governments and banks can tax or confiscate those rights. The gold industry can inflate away that property. Gold coins were too inflexible in the 16th century. They don't represent a solution in the 21st century. In 1914, at the beginning of World War I, the gold standard was thrown overboard within two weekends. That's lips from gold wars. The Genoa Conference in 1922 and Bretton Woods in 1944 show the world will at best create a faux gold standard then corrupt it. If we have gold standards, we are going to get scammed again, quote Michael Maloney. Bitcoin addresses this issue by shifting power into the hands of individuals via cryptography and implementing a decentralized security protocol via proof of work. And therefore it's protecting money from taxation, inflation and confiscation. Billions of individuals can take control of their money via mobile technology and trade with each other at the speed of light via currency of their choice. Hayek said, I don't believe we'll ever have good money again before we take the thing out of the hands of government. That is, we can't take them violently out of the hands of government. All we can do is by some sly roundabout way, introduce something they can't stop. Bitcoin's a money virus. Nobody's ever defended anything successfully. There is only attack and attack and attack some more. That's patent. Gold is defense. Bitcoin is an offense. It's spreading at 200% a year. It's gonna to be to 250 million people by the end of this year. Next stop is a billion. Next stop is everybody. The network is worth 25 trillion a year to solve the strong money problem. The protocols already recruited Binance, Coinbase, Fidelity, PayPal, MicroStrategy, Tesla. We heard Venmo joined. Next will come Apple, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. Bitcoin's an economic imperative. It's a technical imperative. It's a moral imperative. Economically, there's $250 trillion of currency derivatives that are debasing at least 10% a year, that's a $25 trillion a year problem. Every investor needs to store value to survive the currency flood. Technically, this is the greatest mobile application, or this will be the greatest mobile application. Uh, mobile wallets holding digital currency and digital assets. It's gonna allow 5 billion people to trade with each other and protect their life force. Bitcoin is the protocol that synchronizes 100,000 financial applications in cyberspace. It'll be the kingmaker and it's going to tip the balance of power in favor of whichever big tech company firmly in, firm embraces it the most. It's a moral imperative. It's the best hope the human race has for life, liberty and property for the 8 billion people struggling under the weight of excessive regulation, corrupt politicians and collapsing currencies and dangerous physical environments. It is an instrument of economic empowerment. It can be delivered to everybody. So if you believe in sound money, life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness, it's time to abandon gold and move on to Bitcoin. This century, we've digitally transformed messages, books, photos, videos, mo meetings, newspapers, payments, and relationships. Now it's time to transform money. Bitcoin is hope for a better world. Michael Saylor, thank you for your closing remarks. Uh, this is uh, your time now, Frank, your final six minutes to make your case for gold over Bitcoin. All right, well, I think I've made my case already as to what Bitcoin is and Bitcoin isn't with respect to gold, okay? Um, I pointed out the risks that Michael never seems to want to acknowledge. So now at least people can look into that a little bit more carefully. Um, 
the idea that rewards come without risk in this world is, is you can't gloss over that stuff. And, you, and I would just want people to understand the risk of what they're getting into. Um, so you can't keep on selling this as a guaranteed winning lottery ticket. Um, and, and as a cure-all for all the world's ills, you know, some utopian fantasy that you're selling here. Um, it, it, this isn't snake oil and you should stop selling it in that fashion. Um, <clears throat> I, I know that Bitcoin followers, a lot of them, not, not all of them, are real idealists. Um, and Michael is promising you that that world will be delivered to you. I just don't see it. That's not the world we live in. We live in a very, very competitive, ugly world. And I just don't see he's going to achieve that sort of global utopian vision that Bitcoin is going to answer the problems to everything in this world. Um, the idea that Bitcoin can go up by a factor of 10 times, consume all the value of gold, and then consume all the value of bonds, three, four hundred trillion dollars, I, I just don't see what world that could possibly happen in. Uh, it's just, in, in Michael's world, all you own is Bitcoin. That's the only asset class you own. And I, that's, not, <laughs> that's not the way that you're going, it, it's just never going to happen in, 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 in the real world. It's sheer fantasy. Um, and I think that maybe the way you're promoting it, you know, if you only promoted like 10, 20% growth, you wouldn't get all of this massive speculation that's going into Bitcoin, which I think is very, very dangerous. Uh, but I guess it's easier to promise a 20 bagger or a 100 bagger. But the higher it goes, the more outrageous your claims have to become about what Bitcoin is. And, and, and to me, that's very reminiscent of a lot of the research reports I used to read during the dot-com bubble back in 1997 to 99, where they were they had to justify the price and, and, and to justify the price of some of these crazy assets, they had to make some outrageous assumptions. And this is what I'm seeing here in, in Bitcoin. Now, I, I don't want to get personal here, but I, I just find your style of promotion as misleading and filled with hype. Okay, And the one thing that caught my attention and the reason, that the catalyst to why I wanted this debate is when I heard you say time and time again that people should buy Bitcoin, hold it forever, and if they need any cash, they should borrow against their car, their house, their businesses. That is such a reckless and irresponsible thing to suggest. Um, I will bet that 90% of your 700,000 Twitter followers are not millionaires, never mind billionaires like yourself. And we, if, we, if, if these guys are levered up, and we have an 80% correction or a 50% correction in Bitcoin that lasts a few years, you're going to wipe out a lot of small investors. And that should really concern you. I also don't like the style in which social media is being used to bully critics, um, using slogans and, and, and campaign, the, camp, the gimmicks and the slogans like the laser eyes and cyber hornets and have fun staying poor, all this stuff. To me, it smells like a cult. It's cult behavior. Uh, it's not serious. If, and I think if you had more confidence in the value of Bitcoin, you wouldn't have to use that kind of language. Um, so here's the bottom line where I'm, where I'm at with Bitcoin. I think that we live in very uncertain times. I don't think any one of us has experienced a, an investment climate like the one we're seeing today. Not, certainly not in many, many generations. And I, unlike you, don't have a crystal ball. I don't have that benefit. So what I like to do is diversify. You never put your eggs in one basket. That is about the dumbest investment advice anybody could give. Uh, so my suggestion to investors is diversified portfolio skewed toward hard assets because I think that's the environment we're in. And that includes real estate, gold, art, and Bitcoin, if you like, okay? Um, so buy Bitcoin. Knock yourself out. It's probably going to go higher. I've said that before. But the best strategy might be, if you're going to buy Bitcoin, hedge it with gold, because that is gold's purpose. So if, when and if the markets crash, and they will crash again, because we are in a bubble environment, um, you want to, you'd be doing your, your 
Michael, you're doing your, your followers a disservice by telling them to sell their gold. Sure, go ahead and tell them to buy Bitcoin, and if they want to believe everything you're saying about go for it. But to sell their gold is the worst thing they could be doing because they will need it as a portfolio diversifier because it's inversely correlated with what I think Bitcoin is and what equities are. So I'm just asking you to stop with all the hyperbole. I mean, you're selling this utopian fantasy that is going to probably hurt a lot of people. And I just honestly believe buy Bitcoin fine, but you have to own gold as your insurance. And I rest my case. Wow, I have definitely felt the heat in this debate. Thank you both so much for your, your remarks here. And if I can just um, add something, uh, you know, regardless of whichever side you're on, I'm sure we can all come to the consensus. This was an incredible debate, perhaps the best ever to be held on the topic of gold versus Bitcoin. And I am honored uh, to have moderated it. And thank you for choosing Stansberry Research as the platform. And if I can just speak uh, for myself and for the audience, for the folks back home, I just want to say this. Uh, you are both titans in your respective fields. You have nothing to prove. You are both billionaires and you are both very busy and you did not have to do this debate. So I thank you for taking the time to educate us. Thank you. It was, it was a lot of fun and I think we both got our points across. So Michael, thank you for agreeing to do this. And Danielle, you're always, as usual, the greatest host on the planet. Thank, thank you for you. this. Uh, Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks for hosting I us. appreciate it tremendously. I guess my, my question is, because I know Michael had tweeted that he was looking to convince Frank, and I said it at the start, uh, to buy some, some, some Bitcoin, tra transferring some of his, uh, his gold for Bitcoin. Frank, did he convince you on this? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. I, I, I think that um, maybe there might be a time if Bitcoin corrects, which I think has had an incredible run, it's due for a correction, uh, and it might be a very big correction. Yeah, I might buy some, because I think it would go higher and I'll speculate to, to have a position in Bitcoin, but no, as a store of value, absolutely not. <laughs> not yet. Frank, nice to meet you. If you <laughs> buy Bitcoin, I'll buy a case of your olive oil. <laughs> You've done your research. <laughs> I'm sure we can all meet at a beautiful cocktail lounge or bar one day in the future um, and continue this discussion and we could all be friends. So I'm right. gonna keep cheerfully after Frank. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching the great gold versus Bitcoin debate here on Stansberry Research. I am honored to have uh, moderated this incredible debate that will go down in history, I am sure. Thank you for watching. I'm Daniela Camboni. <laughs>